Hi, my name is Dr. Bob Blake of Glendale Community College, and we're here for the Chem 230 lab to do some of the experiments that unfortunately we won't be able to do in a live setting. And I think it's the most fun to do the experiments and to, to get the experience by actually coming and participating rather than watching a video. But the video is a good starting place for your learning. So the experiment that we're going to do today is one of them that I've always been excited about but have never done myself. So hopefully it'll go really well. We're going to make some soap. And so I put on my goggles because we're going to heat a solution and it's going to get pasty so it might splatter. So we definitely want goggles on. And I've done a little bit of prep work. Whenever I do any cooking or any lab work, I want to read the instructions really well and make sure I have most of the supplies and ingredients really close by so that if something's critical time-wise to like add an ingredient while it's in a certain measure of thickness, I'm going to have it at the ready or could get it ready really quickly. I'm also going to want to know what I'm doing in which order because that'll make it less likely that I screw up. So the first thing I did was weigh 10 grams of coconut oil. And you can use pretty much any fat or oil. So originally I believe it was animal fat that was used for soap. Um, vegetable oils work really well too. A lot of people prefer soap made from olive oil. Um, we're gonna start with coconut oil. Uh, I went to a conference once when I first started teaching this lab and the soaps we were getting weren't very good. They uh, didn't clean your hands well and everything. So I asked a whole group of people, does anybody make soap and how do we get a good soap? And somebody said he loves the soap lab, he makes it all the time, he makes it at home. And uh, he said the secret was coconut oil. So I went right out and bought some coconut oil. So that's what we have here, trying to make the best soap we can. A lot of times people use the cheaper vegetable oils, um, uh, rapeseed oil or palm oil, and they may not get as good a result. So I have 10 grams of coconut oil here. And what we're gonna do is add 10 milliliters of ethanol as a solvent. Every once in a while I forget, there's really good techniques for using things like this type of bottle. You grab the penny head stopper with your hand, and then you can hold this with the label in your hand so any spills will be down here. The penny head stopper will be right in your hand. And sometimes I'll be like, wait, this is awkward. When, oh, that's right, I haven't used one of these in about 15 years but I do remember how to grab the penny head stopper, put it between my fingers, pour in the right direction, and we need about 10 milliliters of this. Um, for this particular lab, exact measures are not that important um, to get the result. Some things are excess, some things are the solvent. You notice because of the surface tension, this ethanol is pouring very poorly, and some of it is dripped all over the lab bench and the stir, so I'm gonna go ahead and wipe that up a little bit before we get going. This is flammable, and we don't want a lot of flammable vapors around um, when we turn on the heat and all that, so we're gonna make sure we get this pretty well cleaned up and give it a chance to air out. Um, normally this lab, and something that I've always found odd, the instructions for this lab that we've had at GCC say to heat this with the Bunsen burner, and our safety videos always say, don't heat any flammable organic solvents with the Bunsen burner. So um, I think that's not good to tell people not to do something and then later to tell them to do something. So this time I'm gonna try it with a hot plate, which should get plenty warm enough for this. The boiling point of the ethanol is about 78 degrees Celsius, I believe. And last time I used this burner, we were uh, boiling water at 100 degrees Celsius. And that's one thing that I, I'm re-familiarizing myself as I'm doing the experiments, is if you use a particular hot plate and you know a setting of four or five boils water and you wanna go a little lower temperature, you know to go a little less than four or five. So you'll get a lot better and faster and more accurate when you get familiar with your equipment and familiar with the procedures. The first time through, it's like a little awkward to get things started, but we've got our 10 grams of coconut oil We've got 10 milliliters of ethanol. And the other ingredient is gonna be sodium hydroxide. And if you read a lot of the popular literature that will describe how to make soap, they will say to use lye, L-Y-E. And lye, L-Y-E, is concentrated sodium hydroxide. 
So same thing, different name. And for this we need 13 milliliters approximately. So there's the first 10. And we'll make sure we get that in there. Hopefully trip free. This is a little on the corrosive side. So we're going to want to uh, pay attention to where any spills might occur and clean them up. Often with the neutralizer. We have some sodium bicarbonate neutralizer kicking around. So if any strong acids or strong bases get spilled, we can use the neutralizer to clean them up. And a lot of people are going to use gloves for these chemicals. I'm often going to just rinse my hands right after in case there was a spill I didn't see um, or something along those lines. But if you use the gloves, they're disposable. Use the gloves. If you get a little bit of corrosive material on the gloves and don't take the gloves off, you'll go around and door handles and drawer handles and clamps and everything else will be contaminated with hazardous material. So the people that put gloves on and wear them all day are spreading the contamination around, which we don't really want. So again, anytime I use a hazardous material that's not totally deadly or something, I am gonna go to the sink and rinse my hands just in case there was a little spill that I didn't see. And that's something that you should think of at home as well. When I uh, add chlorine to my pool, the concentrated sodium hypochlorite solution, if you get a drop of that on your skin and it sits there, for the first minute you don't feel anything. But if it sits there for over a minute, it can really get bleaching your skin and can get really painful. So I make sure, that's why a lot of the bottles, they try to make them glug free. They have a path for the air to get in as the liquid goes out because if it splashes and little drops land all over your hands, you may feel pain later that you might not even remember where it came from. So make sure it's good to know the hazards of the material. The sodium hydroxide is a little corrosive. If I handle that and there might be little drips, I make sure I rinse my hand off. So now we have the main ingredients here. We have the fat, coconut oil, which has got plenty of synonyms here. It's a triester, it's a triglyceride, it's a, a fat or an oil. And uh, generally I think fats are solid and oils are liquid. A lot of times teachers tell me this stuff and I don't fact check it all, but um, this is, says right on it, coconut oil. So in a food sense, that's what it is. And the simple procedure here is we're gonna heat this up. Um, when it's not very viscous, we can heat a little more aggressively if we want, and it's gonna boil without splattering um, generally. We're shooting for making a paste. So as we have the sodium hydroxide react with the oil, it's gonna essentially hydrolyze the ester bonds, if you wanna sound all um, scientific and everything. Scientific explanation, it's saponification, which is making the soap from the fat, or it's a hydrolysis of the esters. And so this, um, if you have glycerol links to three fatty acids, you get a triglyceride, the glycerol bond is called a glyceride bond uh, when it's connected to a fatty acid. So triglyceride or triester. And so we're gonna take the ester functional group, reacts with the sodium hydroxide to split the bond, and then we're gonna get the carboxylic acid and the glycerol. And glycerol is a pretty good moisturizer. So a lot of times a little bit of a residual glycerol in our soap is a good thing. Uh, the extra sodium hydroxide in here will then deprotonate the carboxylic acid and make the sodium salt of the fatty acid. The sodium salt of the fatty acid is the soap. And there's gonna be a long time for this to heat up. I mean, the burners get nice and warm, which is good. It's nice and efficient and everything. But we're gonna like boil this down. And a lot of times when you're cooking, you, your grandma and everything would have a really good sense of how to do things and what to do it because she's got a lot of experience. At least my grandma was an amazing cook and just seemed to know how to do everything without even thinking about it. And she'd be adjusting the temperature and everything. There's a little method to madness. So like I said, when this is not very viscous, we could boil it a little quicker and there won't be much of a problem. 
When it gets pasty, it tends to splatter more. So I'm going to want to use less heat when it gets pasty and just let it simmer. So like a lot of times when you make oatmeal or something else like that, and if you love cooking, making molecules is going to be your thing. When you're making oatmeal and you first bring it to a boil, it boils like crazy, no splattering or anything. It's, um, you can rapidly bring it to a rapid boil, but as it starts to thicken up, that's when the little bubbles bursting out of there are likely to throw oatmeal around the room or throw sodium hydroxide around the room if you don't lower the heat and increase the amount of stirring. So like I say, when it's not very viscous and it might bubble really smoothly and I won't have to stir it, but once it starts to get thick, you have to constantly stir it to keep the heat distributed evenly to keep the explosive boiling. And that's the kind of thing that, you know, you can imagine if I print a lab report and put all of those directions, it would get really long and I don't know how many people would read the whole thing and understand and remember all the details. But certainly when I do this, each time I do a synthesis like this, I observe things and add a little bit of skill to my toolbox. So I said, this is right now. And one thing that's clear is there's two layers here. There's uh, the oily layer and the aqueous layer. So the sodium hydroxide is in the bottom and that's what we're heating. The oil is floating on the top. So the two layers there, we're mainly heating the sodium hydroxide and what's hoping what I'm hoping is happening is that the interface, right at the border between the sodium hydroxide layer and the oil layer, uh, there's going to be some reaction that'll take place. And the reaction will happen better when it's warm. So that's why we're heating it, because this reaction is a little tough to break bonds. It's going to need some thermal energy, and that's why we're heating it. And sometimes uh, this can seem boring as I'm heating and heating and heating and it doesn't seem like anything's happening, but the reaction is sort of invisible. And so there could be a lot of molecular action going on in there that needs my attention. And certainly as it boils down and gets thicker, that's when I really need to pay attention, adjust the heat. And unfortunately, it sneaks up on most people. They'll watch this really carefully for about 10 minutes, then they'll get bored and as soon as they're bored and they stop paying attention, then it thickens up and splatters. And especially if you're heating with a Bunsen burner, if the flame gets anywhere near the evaporating alcohol, you can have a fire on your hands if you stop paying attention and don't heat it in the right way. So again, we're going to take the flame out of this picture and just use electrical hot plate so that we don't have a problem with lighting the ethanol on fire. And the story of fat development, as it was told to me, and like I said, there's lots of instructors who would tell me stories, and they sound true and believable and all that. I don't necessarily look up all the details of the history myself. I'm more interested in the history as I get older. But once upon a time, there were lots of slaughterhouses starting to be developed because we like bacon and ham and stuff like that. And the fat part isn't necessarily the most nutritious. So if you kill a pig and harvest all the meat out of it, there's going to be a lot of fat left over. I don't know if you've ever been around a fat bucket where chefs will throw, discard their extra fat, but I worked in a country club once and as a dishwasher, and we threw all of the fat, chicken fat, pork fat, beef fat, whatever they got trimmed off the meat, into a fat bucket. And in the summer, one summer, the company that was supposed to take the fat away did not take it away. So it sat there for like three weeks. And that was the most disgusting smell I've probably ever encountered in my life. So you can imagine a slaughterhouse that's processing thousands of carcasses per week or month or whatever. And all the fat that would be produced as a byproduct of harvesting the meat. And I'm sorry if you think Killing animals is terrible and everything. I agree, killing is terrible, but it's just part of life that people did this. They eat plenty of meat and they produce plenty of fat. Well, people like chemists like playing with materials and seeing, can we turn this useless material into a useful material? So you can imagine they started reacting fat with sodium hydroxide or hydrochloric acid or whatever and trying to find out what the best things you could make out of fat. Well, even what is fat? 
you know, and so if you react, they go ahead and react sodium hydroxide with the fat, and they find out all the glassware they use to do these reactions ends up much cleaner than it was before. They get all these lathers and stuff when they're cleaning up the residue. They find that, you know, they invented soap, essentially. So now you could go to the slaughterhouse that has all this fat they don't want, and they will pay you to take it away. So you take all their fat buckets, you charge them a couple hundred bucks a fat bucket, take all their fat, <laughs> bring it off to the chemistry fac factory, mix it with sodium hydroxide, as we're doing here, um, automated so that you don't have to stand here and stir it for a while, and then you produce this amazing soap that people will pay you money for. So you make money to get your starting materials and you make money to sell the product. So that would be a pretty amazing gig, and if you look at some of the top and wealthiest companies in the world, the uh, soap manufacturers are way up there. Um, as I'm heating this, I see little bubbles, like it's just boiling a little bit. The um, ethanol is starting to boil. Again, if I, sometimes if you just evaporate off all the solvent right away, you don't end up getting the reaction you want. There's generally a good speed for the reaction to take place. We're going to be limited to about an hour for this reaction. So if it doesn't seem to be progressing at all, a little extra heat. If it seems to be going too fast or if it's getting thick and I'm having trouble controlling the boiling and bumping, then I reduce the heat or I can, and don't touch this anywhere down here because it's going to be boiling water temperature, it'll be very hot. But the rim of the beaker often stays at room temperature when you're doing this kind of thing. So it's pretty nice. If uh, I wasn't, if I was going to be really boiling this and there'd be a lot of steam and condensation, I'd get a hot glove or something or some tongs so I could touch this with some metal or some cloth rather than my hand. But I know for this reaction, the way I'm doing it, the temperature I'm using, the rim of the beaker is going to be pretty much at room temperature. So uh, pretty nice. Again, you, don't, you want to be very careful when you're touching any glass that you're heating because it can be extremely hot and it would look um, just like cold glassware. So your eyes aren't going to be a very good uh, guide for you there. Um, now it's boiling a little more vigorously. So as I've been telling stories about fat buckets and pigs and all that, um, the heat has gotten in here and it's starting to boil. So again, I don't want it to be boiling off the solvent so quickly that nothing gets a chance to react. I want to slowly and carefully keep this at a nice high temperature, keep it mixing so that the fat molecules hit the sodium hydroxide molecules, or the sodium ions and are spectators, but the hydroxide ions are what's going to go ahead and attack the fat. So if you're wondering how this reaction works, you have a the hydroxide ion is a great nucleophile and will go attack the carbonyl of the, the ester bond. So we'll probably write that out for you in a pre-lab or post-lab discussion so that you understand what's going on chemically and not just what's going on with the mechanics of making it. So some people are great cooks, but they have no idea what's going on chemically when they're extracting tasty molecules and all that. Uh, ideally, we want you to know both how to make the soap and what the chemical composition is and how it was made. So we've got a nice medium boil. I'm actually a little bit of a slow boil here. And I've been playing a little bit with the temperature adjustment to keep that at a nice slow boil. Although if I did need to speed this up, now would be the time because it's not very viscous. It'll boil really evenly without much splattering. So again, I've said that a couple times, but the thickness of your material often dictates how much heating you can do in what period of time. So the heating rate depends a lot on how viscous the material is and how smoothly it'll boil. Again, this works for the kitchen too. If you're trying to boil down and make a reduction of something, uh, thicken up a marinara sauce, the thicker it gets, the more you have to go simmer and less boil. I had a tooth extracted yesterday, so I've made oatmeal a few times recently, and I'm reminded, turn the heat down when it starts to get thick. And often, if you don't stir it, if I just say, oh, I'm lazy, or I'm tired, let it sit there, the heat will 
accumulate down in the lower part of the solution, and as soon as you start stirring it, it'll go out of control. So again, that's something to uh, be attentive. If we weren't going to a paste, I'd probably be using a mechanical stir and a magnet in there, but that's gonna stop functioning once we get down to a paste. So sort of forced to go ahead with the manual method. The other thing I noticed is uh, you gotta really be attentive when you're stirring about how your stirring motion is because as I get a little bored of this, I'm like, ah, it's boiling, that's exciting. Up, oh, it's been boiling for 10 minutes, that's no longer exciting. Um, I might stir in a way that will throw the beaker off the top of the hot plate. And as much as that sounds ludicrous, like the guy in the video, the old ACS video, he's shaking down a thermometer and he sort of walks haphazardly towards the lab bench and smashes it on the lab bench. It just looks like, who the hell would do that? Well, he's really not paying attention, but when you get start to get bored of something and stop paying attention is when you do those things that you think would be ludicrous. And then it's just embarrassing and dangerous and destructive to have me, like if I were to fling the speaker off the hot plate with the stir. So, as much as it's getting a little boring here, you just imagine what it's like to just be watching it and not stirring. But in any case, that's when I'm most likely to make a mistake is when I stop paying good attention. So it, um, it's really important. And I think I mentioned that in one of the previous videos that it lulls you to sleep with the boredom, but especially I'm focused enough if I wanna make some really good soap. And the only way I'm gonna do that is to execute this experiment really well. And that's gonna demand my attention. Because the other thing is if I uh, get a little bored and in a second throw this off the top of the hot plate, I get to start over. And all this work I've done is lost. The other thing you may notice is I occasionally pull the goggles away from my face a little and move them around. They're starting to fog up pretty badly. It's very warm here, so my core temperature is pretty high and that's gonna cause a lot of water to evaporate off my eyes and condense on the inside of the goggles. I don't wanna unprotect my eyes. If I had a lab partner, I might have my lab partner take over so I could step outside, take my goggles off and defog them. Um, the best I can do right now is just keep them between me and the danger, take, pull them a little away from my head so it creates a space, and then when I move them around, it like allows the drier air to get into the goggles and defogs them. So now as I'm boiling this, it's really starting to thicken up. I have a feeling that most of the ethanol is gone and it's starting to turn into a soap. And as you might expect, when the bubbles form, and it's soap, it's gonna get foamy. So I have to watch if it starts boiling too quickly and I'm not stirring it enough, I might have this foamy mixture grow in volume and grow in volume and overflow the beaker. So again, it's um, really important for me to keep it stirring and to watch it. If it boils too fast or too vigorously, I might get this big foamy mess pouring over the side of the beaker. And although that's a way to make the lab much more exciting really quickly, we, um, we don't wanna do that. I don't wanna clean up a big foamy soapy mess with lots of sodium hydroxide in it when I could just do this the right way and get a nice product of some beautiful soap. So I'll make sure I'm stirring it and watching if it looks like it's gonna go, the foam layer gets too high, I will definitely be dialing the temperature down a little so that fewer bubbles form per minute or whatever. And this is definitely getting cloudy. So one of the things that most soap solutions that I bought are cloudy, they're translucent or cloudy. They're not clear, you know, you can't see through them. And so as the soap is forming, the coconut oil was clear and colorless the ethanol was clear and colorless. The sodium hydroxide was clear and colorless. So now that I'm getting a cloudy solution instead of a clear colorless solution, that's pretty much telling me that we got a reaction happening. 
or it's suggesting it. Sometimes it's just a physical change, not a chemical change, but I have a feeling that this is genuinely starting to uh, form soap. Whenever I do this experiment, or I supervise this experiment, the students, especially if they're tired of doing this, will come to me and look and say, does this look like a paste? And I like them to answer their own questions. So if I came to you and said, does this look like a paste? What I would expect you to do is suggest that I already know what a paste looks like, like toothpaste. So does this look like toothpaste? No, it's way too thin to be toothpaste. So it's clearly not consistent with the paste I'm familiar with. So as much as I might say, oh, I'd love to be done now, I think it's changed and I've made some soap, I really need to uh, keep going until it looks like a paste. Because that's what the instructions call for. All right, so another thing that I'm aware of is that at first we had a lot of ethanol in here, which will boil off at 78 degrees Celsius, right? So if we're at a certain temperature, all the ethanol will boil off. The sodium hydroxide was aqueous. So the sodium hydroxide is in a solvent that will boil at 100 degrees Celsius. So once we're out of the ethanol, we might not be at a high enough temperature to boil off the water and to reduce this to a paste. So um, it looked like it was getting really foamy. And so I turned the heat down a little bit. But you want to continue to pay attention and try to figure out what's going on because at one point it looked like it stopped bubbling all together. So it was not foamy anymore. And that might be because we boiled off the last of the ethanol and it got all foamy. And now we have to start boiling off the water. Again, I turned the heat up a little bit so that now we can boil off the water. Which if you've done a fractional distillation, you know the higher boiling solvent you want to, uh, or higher boiling liquid, you need a higher temperature so you generally have to turn the hot plate up a little more. And that's where like, this is sort of interesting, even though I'm just watching and stirring, to be thinking about what's actually happening and how do I get it to happen better. Should I be reducing the heat when the last of the ethanol boils off, boils off and then turn it back up when I start boiling off the water? At what point am I actually have a soap solution is another interesting thing. But if I can have it smoothly reacting and boiling with a little higher temperature, that's probably a good thing to do so that this isn't a three hour lab. That's, I've always been amazed, sometimes students will finish in like 15 minutes because they believe the setting for the heater is always supposed to be 10 and they have boiled it off, splattered it all over the bench and maybe have an incomplete reaction in 10 minutes. And then other students, you get into an hour and a half later and they still have two clear layers, all the ethanol is still there because they were barely heating it. And so there's a sweet spot where you're heating it enough to get the best possible reaction. And that's going to happen with practice. <laughs> uh, and here we go. It's, uh, it's like it's getting a little foamy again. And the thing is, the uh, hot plates are really good for controlling a nice even temperature at some point. But if this plate gets too hot, and I dial it down, it doesn't instantly change temperature. And that's one of the reasons that a lot of people prefer the Bunsen burner, is you turn the Bunsen burner off and it stops delivering heat instantaneously. When you turn this down, the ceramic plate and the heater element and all that still have a lot of residual heat in. So you could turn this off and just watch it continue to overheat. And that can be really frustrating. You're like, hey, I turned the heat off. Why is it still boiling out of control? So you want to be aware of those types of things. How your equipment works is something you get familiar with. And that's, I've mainly grown up cooking on electric stoves, so I know about the slowness of the heating up and the cooling off of electric stoves, depending, although the modern ones are not as bad as the old ones. And then some people really prefer gas stoves because of instantaneous heat delivery and but now I think we're smoothly boiling. 
I'm sort of wondering how much volume is here now because as you know we put in about 10 grams of fat which is probably a little more than 10 milliliters less dense than water right 13 milliliters of ethanol and or no sorry 13 milliliters of 20 percent sodium hydroxide and 10 milliliters of ethanol so we started with you know 30 35 milliliters of stuff and we're definitely below the 30 mark on the beaker. Beakers aren't usually accurate for volume measurement. I think we started at about the 30 mark and we're well below that now, so we're making progress. Now it's looking very, very milky white. So I think there's a lot of very small bubbles that are you know, bubbling out of the solution as it's I'm boiling off the water. The ethanol is probably all well gone. It's based on the volume change. The first 10 milliliters to go are going to be the ethanol. And now there's some water in there. Of course, the coconut oil, to boil that off would be impossible. Plus, it's transforming into a solid, the soap. So that's not going to go anywhere. We should expect about 10 milliliters of paste, plus whatever water and residual other stuff, glycerin, stays in there. The soap is starting to sort of gather in little clusters and micelles and balls and forming a cloudy solution rather than a clear one. And it's getting very white. As I said, the, um, it'd be easy to say, oh, I have a paste now because it's milky white, but it's still very thin and watery. The other thing I'm sort of consciously doing a little bit is a lot of times when you are doing something like this, some of the coconut oil might get up on the sides of the flask or the sides of the beaker, whatever you're, and you might want to make a little effort to get whatever has gone up on the sides to make its way back down into the reaction mixture so that you don't have unreacted starting materials sitting in the, along the sides of the beaker. If I were to do this again, I would probably have the heat up a little higher, a little earlier although that might be really dangerous because at one point it was really foaming and at the rate I was heating it, the foam stayed contained in the lower half of the beaker. I don't know if it would have got out of control if I were heating it a little more vigorously. So there's certainly some key points at which I wanted to make sure I wasn't heating it too quickly. But overall it's taking a little longer than I would expect is perfect. Although, I don't know, this might give us the best soap if we do it this slowly. So, best thing to do when you're doing a, developing a process is to try it five or six different ways and look to see what the result is. If, um, if you have to do it this slowly to get the best soap, you may automate the process a little more, but you may go with a really slow heating. Uh, it's really thickening up now. It's almost like when I stir it, the little stir leaves a wake of a line, an indentation in there. It doesn't collapse right back to flat right when it uh, goes through. So it's starting to be a little more, I would say if I had to describe it right now what it was like, it's like whipped cream or heavy cream. It's not, it's not quite pasty, but it's very creamy, sort of turning into a thick sauce. And what are we shooting for? Direction say, paste. So my internal clock says I've been doing this for about a half an hour, which sometimes I've had reactions where I've had to babysit them for five hours. So depending on the chemistry you're doing and whether you have automation or not, you might have to be a very patient person to do some reactions. And this even heating is really, really important when it gets thick. Because if there isn't the ability for this to go convection and for currents to form based on the, light, heavy, the hotter stuff being less dense and rising to the top and everything, then the hot stuff can get stuck right against the hot part of the hot plate, the bottom, and it will be burning at the bottom while it's not even cooking at the top. So that's again something to be very aware of when you're cooking in your house or here that if you've got a thick paste, and I'm trying to remember what it is that I've made 
that if you're not really careful to keep it moving, you can burn it in the bottom of the pan and end up with burnt bottom of the pan and not cooked yet top of the pan. And so that's total disaster. I hate burned food. So you make sure if it's very thick, you get your, uh, keep your stirring going. Super, super important. So now it's like getting past the thick cream stage and getting into the it's pretty pasty stage. Temper my excitement to go on to the next step and make sure this really is what I'd call a paste before I go on to the next step. Now it's resembling what I would call in, if you ever do egg whites and you need to make a cake like a German chocolate cake, you have to beat the egg whites to stiff peaks. And now it's almost to the stiff peaks stage. It's so milky white, it's why it's reminding me of egg whites. Or toothpaste. All right, now it's like meringue. You ever do a meringue? That's again where the stiff egg white peaks are coming into play. I de get the definite feeling that there's solid precipitating out of this. It's not a homogeneous cloudy solution. I think there's solids forming in it and I think it's pretty pasty. So what I'm going to do is take it off the heat, put it on the bench, turn the hot plate down a little to off, and then check to see and it says, and I knew this, that I have to add 50 milliliters of saturated aqueous sodium chloride, but I was looking to see if it says that I needed to add it to a cool paste or if I can add it when it's warm. So right now, it is very nice and pasty or like a meringue, I would say, if I really wanted to tell you what it looked like. And I'm going to go ahead and measure out the saturated sodium chloride and we need 50 milliliters of this added and what this does is it salts out the soap so in concentrated salt water soap is not that soluble so this will help to uh, drive the salt out of the soap out of the solution so we get an adequate picture of this pastiness See, it's definitely not a solution anymore. It's not viscous, it's very pasty. So now we're gonna get, it's finally, we've gotten to the pasty stage and yay, the fans go wild. So now I'm gonna add the 50 milliliters of saturated sodium chloride. And man, that made it go solid right away. I don't know whether it's more because it just cooled it off. But yeah, it's now I'm sort of busting the soap pieces out of the blast. Everything solidified right when that saturated sodium chloride hit the, hit the beaker. So what I want to do is bust it up a little bit because if that solidified and formed like sort of rocks of salt, of soap, then in the center part, it might trap a lot of the sodium hydroxide or whatever else. So if I wanted to clean this up and get all the sodium hydroxide out of there, I would work on even maybe with a mortar and pestle, like breaking up all these chunks and make it almost like a fine powder if I could. So the danger there though is I'm using a glass rod and if I were to apply too much pressure to the glass rod, I might break it. So that's something you definitely want to be careful about is if you're using a glass piece of apparatus, you don't want to exert too much pressure and especially not sideways. So me sort of driving down on these chunks vertically with a glass rod is going to be much less likely to break it than if I start pushing sideways like this. Of course, if I just use the right amount of force, I don't really have a problem with it, but there's a couple of really big chunks in here that I probably should work on busting up so that they'll wash and the sodium hydroxide will get out of there. 
I said, if a clump forms really rapidly, it can trap impurities in the center of the clump. And that's why the recrystallization works so well, because under the conditions of the recrystallization, all the molecules that'll form on the crystal slowly find their way to the surface of the crystal and attach, and any impurities aren't gonna stick as well, so they're not gonna get, but if you form the crystal really quickly, all the molecules that form the crystal can trap something underneath them. So that's why when I dumped this in and it went hard right away, I was like, oh no, I might have trapped a bunch of sodium hydroxide or glycerin or some of the other things that are in here, in there. And so we might not be able to wash away all of the sodium hydroxide and glycerin unless we bust this up really well. So again, I'm just sort of playing now. I'm, this is different and more exciting than the stirring was. So I'm just feeling around for chunks and trying to bust them up. A lot of the chunks are just gonna avoid the stir bar altogether. So like there's a big chunk here that as much as I've been playing, you keep scooching out of the way and staying together. The other time I can bust them up is once I've filtered this, of course, and it's on the filter paper, then I can do some busting up with maybe a spatula or the stir bar, stir rod. So let's go ahead and let this marinate for a bit. And we'll set up our filtration apparatus. That's something I might do ahead of time or while this is stirring, while I was stirring it, my partner could have been setting up the filtration apparatus. Um, definitely wanted to show you setting this up so you remember that you need a filter trap to protect the vacuum pump. The vacuum system is very expensive. We do not want to mess with the vacuum pump. So when I say mess with the vacuum pump, we don't want to send liquids in through the vacuum. So here's vacuum adapter out to trap. And watch these hoses. When you're pushing on the hoses, they can exert some force. So I was almost in a position where I was gonna knock over one of these graduated cylinders with the hose. Definitely don't wanna do that. If you put twists in them, they tend to twist back. So you wanna make sure that this is not getting twisted up, that when you move the hose, you don't push it into something else. All right, so there's our vacuum trap flask vacuum trap adapter, and it's probably good for me to put the hose on this first. Because when it's mounted here, it's a little clumsy for me to do that. And then, um, then I've got the other flask and the other big clamp. So these nice filter flasks, I've got one for the filter trap and the other for the filter funnel or Buchner funnel. The little teeny filter funnel is a Hirsch funnel. And we pay homage to a lot of famous guys. When they make something really useful, we name it after them. And so Buchner apparently, super famous guy. Buchner funnel. And make sure this is all stable and sturdy. We're gonna filter through the Buchner funnel and the filter paper into the filter trap, out to the vacuum. So there's our little setup. Get some deionized water. And it's often good to wet this a little bit first with just some pure water. And then turn on the vacuum and that'll seat the filter in place. So now we're ready to filter and to get all our nice soap. So, you notice the foaming in the bottom there, so it looks nice and lathery, which is pretty cool. And it looks like getting all of this out of the beaker is gonna be pretty straightforward. Some of this, um, as I said, when I salted it out and put the sodium chloride solution in there, a lot of the stuff that was all melty and liquid looking and or foamy is now uh, turned immediately into a hard solid. So if I really wanted super pure soap, I would probably be drying this out and then getting a mortar and pestle and breaking it up into a fine powder 
and then washing it because then I would surely get all the sodium hydroxide to wash out. But this guy, um, we got quite a good yield of soap here. And it says in the instructions that I'm to uh, sort of bust this up and mash it so that the water will get out. So a lot of this uh, soap will also have a lot of water in it, trapped in it. And busting that up and letting it dry would be good to get a good yield of dry soap. Right now I'm not as concerned with the yield of dry soap because I'm going to make a solution with it and then test some of its chemical properties. So I want to know, does this soap really, is it going to lather well? Is it going to be a good soap for me to use? And is it, um, is it excessively basic? So I mentioned there may be a lot of sodium hydroxide trapped in here. I'd love to get a pH on this soap solution because if there's a ton of sodium hydroxide in there, the pH would be like 13 and it'd be corrosive and we wouldn't want to get it on our hands. If this is, um, most of the sodium hydroxide has washed out, then it's going to be not very basic and it'll be a little more comfortable for our hands and better for long-term use. But there we go. We've gone ahead and filtered to isolate our soap. And I think we would normally, like I said, mash it up and then wash it again with ice water if we want to get all the sodium hydroxide out of there. So that's it for now. We're going to test the properties of the soap solution we made and compare it to a commercial soap product so we can see how do we like our soap compared to the other products.